ya las mesas de trabajo terminaron su tarea eh, ayer, ayer por la noche y por tanto la estructura de esta última jornada que durará hasta el mediodía, al mediodía madrileño y español, que me dice sobre las 2 de la tarde, ¿no? sobre las 12 del mediodía, va a consistir en una jornada en la que y Dominique Terrol, su presencia en Madrid y su presencia en este Congreso. Muchas gracias y vuestra atención. Uh, bueno, muchas gracias Juan Miguel por las presentaciones. Es un, un lugar común decir que los que nos acompañan hoy uh, apenas la necesitan, apenas necesitan presentación y, y, um, y en este caso es más verdad que nunca. Le recuerdo solamente el formato que vamos a tener. Va a haber dos presentaciones de 45 minutos por parte de cada uno de ellos. En primer lugar hablará Peter Eisman y después Dominique Perrol. Y a ello seguirá lo que yo creo que puede ser el, el, lo más interesante y atractivo de, de esta reunión, que es el debate entre ambos sobre el hilo conductor de lo que ha sido eh, este Congreso. Paisajes culturales o paisajes de la cultura. Los dos arquitectos pertenecen a generaciones distintas. Y su vinculación con el paisaje es múltiple en muchas direcciones. De hecho, um, Peter Eisman va a presentar un, un edificio, la Ciudad de la Cultura de Galicia, que solo puede inter interpretarse y, y presentarse en este Congreso como, como un elemento de paisaje. Y Dominique Perrol se centrará en dos intervenciones, una completamente paisajística, la de la playa de las Teresitas, en las Islas Canarias, y la otra, una pieza de arquitectura, la, la caja mágica, pero que está inserta en una reorganización, como sabe, muy ambiciosa, la ciudad de Madrid, que es el soterramiento de, de la M30 y la recuperación del río Manzanares. Su vinculación, como digo, con el paisaje será puesta de manifiesto por sus dos intervenciones y los edificios que van a ser, que van a ser objeto de debate aquí. Pero lo que, el hilo conductor, que espero que sea el, el, el argumento de nuestra conversación, es el entendimiento por parte de ambos de la arquitectura como un fenómeno de cultura. La arquitectura hoy en la prensa ¿verdad? y en el debate público se asocia tantas veces a, al negocio y a la construcción de lo que se ha llamado el sector inmobiliario, que defender la arquitectura como parte de la cultura de nuestro tiempo es algo que no siempre es eh, tan obvio como los que aquí estamos, eh, pensamos, eh, fuera de estas puertas. La arquitectura como fenómeno cultural y la arquitectura como producción simbólica es lo que ha unido a las carreras de, de Peter Eisman, una carrera en muchos sentidos tardía, y la carrera de Dominique Perrol, Uh, que por el contrario es casi precoz, ¿eh? que debuta con su, con su gran biblioteca de París, 
Ahora son dos arquitectos que, como digo, están en su madurez intelectual y artística y creo que será un privilegio escucharles primero y tener la ocasión ¿verdad? De, de polemizar o de conversar después al final de sus intervenciones. Yo no voy a extenderme más, solamente eh, le voy a dar la palabra a Peter Eisman, él va a hablar desde, desde aquí, desde la mesa, nosotros nos vamos a retirar y eh, quiero pedir a los técnicos de iluminación recordarles que durante los primeros 20 minutos no va a proyectar imágenes y por tanto quiere que la luz esté en, en el nivel más alto para luego volver a la penumbra cuando comencemos con la presentación de PowerPoint. Y nada más. Peter, cuando quieras. Uh, you guys are going to leave me? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have the lights on for a reason, um, because I would like to try and share with you as an audience some ideas that uh, about the world of architecture today, which I find very problematic. And um, it was very interesting. I got a telephone call yesterday from the organizers saying, where are your images? And uh, um, I hadn't brought any images because um, in the United States, architects are expected <clears throat> to speak to their audience as if they were uh, slightly more than idiots. Uh, and so they show them images. I mean, I sh shall not mention some of the archi stars that float around the universe, but they show hundreds of images And uh, they say, there's the front door, there's the facade, there's the plan, there's the view, there's the this, there's the that. <clears throat> And they treat their audiences like idiots. Um, I find that very offensive. Um, and so I will try and be serious since I've come all the way uh, to Spain to speak. And you have come uh, from your Uh, Friday night left over to an early Saturday morning. It's not the best time to be speaking uh, anywhere, but uh, I suppose it's better than speaking on Sunday, uh, especially with a big match this weekend. So uh, we're sandwiched between uh, a nice party on Friday night and a nice party on uh, Sunday. What is Peter Eisenman worried about? I'm worried about the fact that we live in a media age, uh, which we can do nothing about, which increasingly gets more and more invasive into our lives. In the United States, it's very difficult to walk down the street uh, without people with cellular phones speaking. Uh, in an elevator, in a small crowded elevator, people are speaking on the top of their voices on cellular phones, or they have things plugged into their ears in another world. Uh, and we now have a thing in the United States called iPhone, which gives you instant messaging, email, uh, news, telephone, music, anything you want. You're just wandering around like attached to a, uh, a virtual computer. Um, and less and less, people are able to participate in the world. Uh, they don't see anything when they're walking around the street. They don't hear anything. They don't realize how disturbing their public behavior is. Uh, they have no concern for others in this public realm because uh, they are so mediated. And I, uh, for me, mediated means sedated. Um, that people have become more and more passive. The more they become passive, and this is particularly the case in the United States, the more they are presented in the media with supposed choices. 
vote for this, vote for what news story you want to hear, vote for what popular song you want, vote for what commercial you want to see, vote for this, vote for that, and they think they're participating. They're actually participating in nothing. Uh, and so there is this incredible uh, charade that has dropped down upon, uh, at least in our country, and it'll soon be here. Do not worry about that. Spain will not be uh, without this overly hyper-mediated culture. What happens is that in this passivity, people demand more and more images, uh, something easily consumable uh, because they, they have no capacity to concentrate, they have no capacity to, to wait. Uh, I mean, why do people need cell phones all the time? I mean, what is it they're communicating to whom? What did they do before cell phones, right? What did they do before? I mean, I'm a, a computer junkie myself. I get into the hotel room, I have my computer, I turn it on, I have to get my email. You know, why do I need to do that? Uh, it's become a, a, a terrible, terrible, for me, situation and for others around. What it means is that architecture also falls victim to this passivity because the more people are passive, the more they need uh, energy from the, their images. What are the things that are most imageable? Buildings. And so buildings have gone crazy. Um, all you have to do is look at the new uh, work in China, uh, the new work in Dubai, in uh, Abu Dhabi, etc. You cannot win a competition today just doing a straight building, all right? You have to do a building that twists, that turns, that, uh, you know, jumps around. Uh, it, it's amazing, all right? So that's part one. <clears throat> now, you are a young group of architects. Every group of young architects wants to be avant-garde, right? All of my students, and I, I, I teach at a university in the United States, they don't want to know about Palladio. They don't want to know about Le Corbusier. They want to know, give us the latest cocaine. What is the, what is the latest drug? Right? We want to know how to make Zaha Hadid, right? How do you be Zaha, especially women, they want to be Zaha Hadid, right? Uh, how, how do you do Zaha Hadid? I don't even know how, how to do Zaha Hadid. And I don't know what makes it of any value. But it is clear that this passive culture uh, has an enormous yearning for that which is easy that which is you can see in a moment and you don't have to look at it again. And they want to know how to do this. So uh, this is where young people are uh, because all young people want to do the latest thing. This is nothing uh, new. What I'm here to say is it's impossible in this very moment in our existence to be avant-garde. And the reason for that is that any time there is an avant-garde, there is a new, what, I, what is called paradigm. And paradigm shifts occur not very frequently. There certainly was a paradigm shift uh, in the early 20th century from academic work uh, to the idea of modernism. <clears throat> and why was there that shift? Because people were inventing airplanes, they were inventing automobiles, they were inventing new mechanical industrial processes. Einstein was talking about new kinds of mathematics uh, that talked about space and time uh, in a new way. Freud was talking about new forms of unconscious behavior and psychological behavior, understanding how people could operate. And so it was quite natural that architecture, uh, surrounded by this uh, sensibility, 
began to shift from an academic condition uh, to what we know to be modernism. And this was a quite a natural situation. Uh, architecture didn't lead. Architecture gave concrete reality to the experiences of the unconscious, of the new ideas of space and time, of the new speed of movement, of the new industrialization, of the new idea of the working class. Uh, <clears throat> All that came to an end at the end of uh, the, uh, the 1930s and 40s, not only in Spain, uh, but in the rest of Europe, because modernism failed. And modernism was seen to have lost its way. Uh, the, the, the movements of the right crushed this new spirit. And architecture which was always seen in the 20s and 30s as a uh, St. Paul figure pointing the way to the New Jerusalem or a St. George figure slaying the dragon of the old had a real symbolic value. The architect was a, a, a leader, uh, a hero. We then had uh, a second revolution, the 68 revolution, when the students who had in fact endured the war uh, and uh, their parents and seen what had happened realized that nothing was better. In other words, things hadn't gotten better. There had been two major world wars, a civil war in this country and the place was still problematic. And so what happened in the 60s is that the students took to the streets and to their institutions. But instead of a war, a, a civil war or a conflagration out, there was an implosive event. In other words, the students and the underprivileged, the blacks in America, etc., cetera, uh, burned their own institutions, their schools, their their, their own uh, in, uh, neighborhoods. And this was a different kind of revolution. And in that revolution, uh, there were several philosophical texts that were written. There were several architectural texts that were written that were really significant and remain significant today. Aldo Rossi wrote a book called The Architecture of the City. Vittorio Gregotti wrote a book called Territorio. Manfredo Tafuri wrote a book called Theories in History. Robert Venturi wrote a book called Complexity and Contradiction. All in that very collapsed moment between 66 and 68. And there was this sense that there was a new paradigm. This was also followed at the same time or uh, joined by Jacques Derrida writing of grammatology and Gilles Deleuze writing in Thousand Plateau and uh, Guy Debord writing The Society of the Spectacle where Debord predicted in 68 what was going to happen to us today that would, we would become victims of the spectacular. And this was a new paradigm. And, uh, and so what happened, what architecture turned to uh, the most uh, kitsch phenomenon because it, it didn't know what else to do because the spirit uh, didn't tell them, it never does, uh, where to go. And we had postmodernism, the sort of uh, return to historicism, to imagery that uh, uh, allowed people to think they understood where the world was. And then in 1988, uh, several of us uh, Rem Koolhaas, Frank Gehry, myself, Daniel Liebeskind, Zaha Hadid, etc., participated, Bernard Schumi, in an exhibition called Deconstructivism at the Museum of Modern Art, which killed uh, the sort of kitsch, nostalgic postmodernism. Uh, but it also had no ideological framework. It looked merely stylistic. It didn't understand what Derrida, and I'm not going to give you a lecture on Derrida, uh, today, but did not understand uh, what the problematic was. 
And so then too, deconstructivism died. Um, and uh, in the late 90s. And we are today, we are no longer in modernism, we're no longer in postmodernism, we're no longer in deconstructivism, we're no longer anywhere. And uh, Theodore Adorno, uh, writing in the <clears throat> after the war, talked about this moment in time that has happened before. And he called it Spätstil, or late style. He said, and there is always a moment before a new paradigm, before there is something that's possibly new that we can understand. And this is late style. And we, I, I think, are in a moment of late style. He spoke about, uh, especially in regard to music, to uh, Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. And he said, Misa Solemnis is a moment in Beethoven's career, at the end of the career, at a time when it was impossible to write something new, he wrote something difficult. And that people didn't understand. It was completely uh, out of characteristic of Beethoven, anarchic, etc. But it had the seeds of the possibility of the future. And what I'm here to say is that while it is impossible to be avant-garde, it is still possible to be young. It is still possible to challenge the present, uh, not to merely accept passively the fact that there is nothing new possible. And I believe that out of the idea of late style comes the possibility of a new paradigm. What that will be? I can't teach it. My students ask me, where are we going? What is the next, what is the future? And I said, listen, the more you are concerned about the future, the more you are condemned to live in the past. Please live in the present. And my message to you is, I don't have any answers, but to think about the future when, it, when there is no possible thought is to condemn yourself to a past as the present. And so I'm, I'm suggesting that there are ways of thinking about today that I think are very useful. I believe that <clears throat> new paradigms occur every 40 or 50 years. I believe uh, there is a secular thing. If we look at the movement of the French Revolution, we look at the movement of Romanticism, we look at the movement of academicism, modernism, postmodernism, etc. <clears throat> we are on the cusp of a new paradigm. Where is the energy for that cusp? I look to the events of M11 and 9-11 in New York. I look to the moments of uh, terrorism, which are, again, an attack on not merely uh, civic institutions, as it were, they are an attack on the West, and they are an attack on the corruption and passivity of the West, uh, the colonialism, the, the economic energy that we just keep feeding, the notion of acquiring things. And I think it has a, a message for architecture. First of all, uh, both of those attacks were in symbolic places. The World Trade Center is not about world trade. It was two of the tallest buildings symbolic of New York. And they were attacked as architecture. Atocha Station is also a symbolic place in Madrid, a symbolic place of the infrastructure, etc. And so I think that we have to realize that these attacks were both symbolic in terms of, of, of an idea of the West, but also about uh, architecture. What happens is that where architecture has gotten lost in the spectacular, in the idea of image and, and um, what I call branding, is the fact that it has lost its metier that is space and time 
and become surface. We have become overwhelmed with the interest in surface. Now what is interesting is that painting was always the collapse of space and time into surface, and architecture was always the, the taking of surface and bringing it into space and time. And we have turned architecture, our patrimony, into painting, into surface decoration. I, I don't want to name uh, my colleagues who I have great respect for, but we are collapsing that patrimony. Another thing that is happening, and it is not merely due to outside passivity, it is due to the passivity of our teachers, of our architects, of our students, is that we are losing faith in what has been for 500 years what I call the synthetic project. That is the project that took plan, section, and elevation and made space from them, that assumed that these ingredients were important to architecture. Today, my students cannot make plans. They say, who needs sections? We don't need sections anymore. We need facades. Uh, teach us how to make facades. And for me, this loss of faith in the synthetic project is uh, what is at stake, I think, in architecture for us. And the question is, is this attitude a right attitude? Is this question right? Is the synthetic project an old project? Is it no longer part of the Geist that we live in? A second critique is on the famous words of Leon Battista Alberti, who said, uh, a house is a small city, a city is a large house. In other words, talking about a relationship of the part to the whole. That relationship has sustained architecture for 500 years. Now it is under attack. People, my students, my young architect friends, no longer believe in the part to whole relationship. They no longer believe that it's necessary, that the important thing is the part by itself. The great young American architect, Greg Lynn, former student of mine, says the only thing that is important is the component. It doesn't matter about the whole. It's the component. So we have on the one hand the idea of surface and the other idea of the part of the component. And the reason for this is that we can now, in computation, in the digital, we can make all sorts of component relationships, and we can manipulate them into all sorts of value-free holes that look fantastic, each one of them different, and none of them saying anything. But it's no longer necessary to say anything as long as you can make components. It is impossible for a student to take uh, a computer program uh, 3D Studio Max, Rhino, uh, all of these fabulous uh, computer modeling programs designed for car manufacturers, for auto manufacturers, for shoe designers, etc., that architects use, um, and make a plan. Because you cannot connect dots and make a plan. You can't sit there and here's a dot and you go dip. You can't see anything. You cannot understand the whole. And so because of computation, because of the digital revolution, we have become involved in the part, in the component. And the whole doesn't matter. For me, I get up every morning, even though I'm giving you a very dreary view of as I see the world, I get up every morning very hopeful. I get up every morning because I love taking my students' heads and knocking them together, right? And hopefully uh, something will happen, right? 
I don't let them use computers. I make them draw Palladio. They complain violently to the head of the school. Why do we have to draw Palladio? We're not going to be able to get a job knowing Palladio, right? They're only worried about getting a job. And I said, who gives a damn about a job that's worthless? Uh, you know, that you can only buy worthless things uh, with the money you make. I said, think about Palladio. And since they can't think about Palladio, their teachers can't think about Palladio, we get the kind of architecture we see all around us today. I'm sorry, excuse me. Anyway, uh, I'm here merely to knock a few heads together. Uh, I still try very hard. Uh, I love architecture. Um, I think I was talking to a young, one young gentleman about film. I think film understands the situation today better than we as architects. I think painters understand the situation better. I think people in literature understand the situation better. I think we in, as architects are not certain how to deal with the, the late style. With that, I'm going to show you a project because I'm required to show a few pictures, otherwise you would think me not an architect, of a project I love very much that is being built in Spain uh, very beautifully and very slowly in Santiago de Compostela. Um, you've all seen the pictures, so I won't say very much about them. Is it late style? Yes. Uh, does it have a message about the future? No. Is it an interesting project as a commentary? I think it's a very interesting project. The fact that it's being built in Spain, I couldn't build it in the United States, wouldn't be allowed to. Uh, what's so interesting is that most of my work, and I would say 90% of it, I have four or five projects now in Italy, projects in, in Germany, etc. I don't build in the United States. Why? Because the US is the capital of this passivity, all right? We are the spreaders of passivity because we need to create new markets, China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, etc. And I believe that Europe is a great hope to stand against this spreading passivity coming from my country because it's strong enough and has a culture that is strong enough uh, to be able to at least think about these issues. I cannot make this talk in the United States. My students and the audience wouldn't understand. I make this talk for you as a kind of warning of this seeping miasma that is creeping uh, out of my country uh, into various parts of the world, oh, Dubai, crowded with American architects. I have a friend, a very good architect, couldn't get a job in the United States uh, for years, out of work architect, very good. He's now moving to Dubai because Dubai is the future for all of those people who have been washed up on the shore of capitalism, right? They find a new exotic playground. Uh, good luck. Anyway, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm a happy monkey. Uh, I get up every morning and think my, I have my whole life to live. And why not come and tell you a funny story, right? Uh, it's a, it's a, as good as anything else. Um, so what I want to do is uh, show you the latest pictures of Santiago. Very quickly, if we turn the lights down and... and uh, I hope somebody will run the machine because I don't know how to run computers. Clearly, I don't know how to run the earphones either. Uh, I don't need this, right? No. Okay. Hopefully, these pictures came via email last night. Um, uh, can we? Yeah, do you want to do that for me? Why don't you just sit down here? I feel much more comfortable. I still, you know, attractive woman sitting next to you is much in the dark. You know, I'm now in heaven. Can you, you stay here? Because I'm going to be looking over there. Or, 
I have no idea. You can't ask me what to do. Is that the first? No. Is that the first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Can, yeah, that's it. Can we move to the bigger? Make it bigger? Yay! There you go. So you're gonna you you're gonna push the things? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a picture of the uh, city of culture in uh, Galicia. Let me just see if this uh, pointer works. Oh, you have to turn it on. You see. Yeah, it's working now. You think? And I just do this. Oh, does this also go forward and backward? You think so? Well, we'll see. Then you can you know you can watch too. Then. Okay. So uh, here is the uh, Cathedral of uh, Santiago, the Obradorio here. Uh, and this is the, uh, the state of, uh, well, a few months ago, construction. The, the towers of John Haydock here, the Emeroteca, now the archive building, the library building here, uh, the museum uh, and the research institute. We have started, this is all now under construction, which is the end of the, the music hall. And across the way, we are starting the foundations of the sixth building, uh, which is the International uh, Art Center. Next. Wait, let me just see if I can do this. No, it doesn't. No. OK. Here was the uh, competition model. Uh, we won the competition uh, against uh, uh, a lot of Archie stars. Um, and uh, it was an idea to do something unlike Bilbao, because the Bilbao effect was very important. And uh, uh, the uh, Bilbao had become an important center. And Galicia wanted to do the same thing. And we said, if we make an object, we will lose. And all of our competitors made objects, and we made uh, a landscape. In other words, buildings that uh, took the top of Monte Gaias uh, and uh, uh, turned it into uh, a, a landscape as opposed to building. Next. I won't explain these diagrams, but their whole idea uh, of the old Caminos, the pilgrimage Caminos. We placed uh, a plan of the, uh, uh, of the old town uh, on the hillside and then disrupted it with uh, the, the topography, which was different. So there was a play between topography, uh, uh, virtual forces, of, uh, computational forces, uh, and the old city. Next, please. And uh, this was the kind of virtual model that we made of the buildings. Next, uh, we took a Cartesian grid. Uh, these colors stand for functions. Uh, and we twisted them according to the previous diagram so that the, you had overlay onto the Cartesian uh, geometry a, another kind of topological and topographical uh, geometry. So there were the three kinds of, of energies uh, superposed into one. Next. This was the section of uh, through the buildings, the uh, Emeroteca Library uh, Music Hall and Research Building from one side, and here it is from the other. Next. Uh, the rendering of uh, what it will be like the scale of these Caminos, you can see, are very, uh, very tight. Um, and uh, you can see the Cartesian grid etched into uh, local stone uh, from Galicia. Quarzita is the stone, uh, very rarely used uh, for building. Next. And this was the, the landscape project. This is the Emeroteca Library. Uh, music hall, etc. The buildings, the the uh, plaza in the center, and the the connection to the autostrada and the caminos that take will take people from uh, the cars and buses down to the old town. 
Next. And here's a view from uh, downtown in Santiago, a view of the uh, historical museum. You can see the scale of this is uh, quite enormous compared to the towers of Hayduk, the, 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 the cathedral without a body. Next. And this is the same building from uh, the site um, with the, uh, the, the quarzita uh, on the roof uh, using the reddish color and then the facades, uh, a, a white color stone. Next. And uh, you can see the scale of the, this is the um, history museum. Next. And you can see the, the, the construction of the roof uh, on a steel uh, underpinning so that, that all of the exhausts, the ducts, the usual things on roofs are hidden beneath uh, a, a double layer of roof. Next. The interior of the uh, museum Next, and this is again this uh, uh, research building. You can see the Cartesian grid, uh, several scales, a, 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 a giant scale that covers the whole project you can see here, and a secondary scale. So there are many scales operative um, in the project. Uh, next three layers of, uh, of uh, facade, uh, which we've worked on in, in a very uh, articulate way. And you can see how the roof is being made. The first, the, the actual roof, and then the, the steel uh, secondary structure, and the overlay of the, of, of the stone. Uh, each panel uh, working uh, together uh, individually so that the water goes through to the roof and comes down. Next, uh, the interior, uh, this is the interior of the uh, library. Next, here you can see the Emeroteca and the library we were just talking about and the site for the music hall. Next. The interior of the library is now all finished. Next. But there's a whole play of space because first of all, uh, there's an upper level here, a median level here, and the space comes through and a lower level down. So there's a, an incredible sectional play uh, from the exterior through to the interior, all enjoined uh, in section plan, and there's no one facade. There's, here's an exterior facade, here's an interior facade, and then another facade back here. So there are layers of facade. Next, please. Uh, again, uh, a series, you can see the layering uh, of the, how the ceiling and the floors work uh, to articulate the section. Next. Next, the different color stone, the white, whitish color on the facade and the reddish color on the roof. Next, I don't know why we have that one, that's probably the end. Next, it's it, solo. Okay, thank you very much.